Good morning, guys. Um, so today, since we've been working on adding and subtracting fractions with like denominators, today we're going to add and subtract mixed numbers. So just a reminder, a mixed number and an improper fraction. We've, we've dealt with both of these. So an improper fraction is when the numerator is bigger than the denominator. So 7 thirds is an improper fraction. It's when the numerator is bigger than the denominator. A mixed number would be 2 and 1 third. That's a mixed number. We have a whole number and we have a fraction. So we're going to deal with mixed numbers today. Improper fractions, easy. If we were adding those, we could do um, 7 thirds plus 5 thirds. 7 thirds plus 5 thirds. 7 plus 5, 12. Our denominator stays the same. Easy. We can also subtract improper fractions the same way we've been subtracting. 7 minus 5, 2. Denominator stays the same. Thirds. Same thing. So we are going to add and subtract mixed numbers. And I suggest writing this with me. So I'm going to do add and subtract. numbers. And I'm actually going to do two examples. The first example I'm going to do is adding and then the second example I'm going to do is subtracting. So let's start with adding. <clears throat> so step one is we are going to add or subtract whole numbers. And we will, I will explain what that means right now. So let's do, our number is, our equation is 3 and 1 fourth plus, uh, let me write this a little small, sorry. 3 and 1 fourth plus 5 and 2 fourths, okay? That's going to be our addition problem. We'll do subtraction after. I was going to do them at the same time, but I think I'm going to do them after. So our whole numbers. Our whole numbers are these, right? Those are our whole numbers. They're not fractions, they're not pieces of a number, they're our entire number. So that's easy enough, add or subtract. In this case, we are adding. Um, so what is three plus five? Eight. That is what we are doing. Three plus five is eight, okay? Simple enough. Now let's move on to step two. Okay, step two. So we can go across. It's going to be add or subtract numerators. So let's bring that problem down again. We have 3 and 1 fourth plus 5 and 2 fourths. We already added our whole number whole numbers. So now we are going to add or subtract the numerators. We are going to add the numerators. Our numerators are on top. What is 1 plus 2? 3. Now let's move on to step 3. Three very easy denominators. Stay the same. OK, 
Okay, so we have three and one fourth plus five and two fourths. We have eight as our whole numbers. We have three as our numerators. Denominators stay the same. What are our denominators in this problem? Denominators are down. Pull over four. Eight and three fourths is our answer. So if we follow these steps, we can do this pretty quickly. First step is add the whole numbers. Second step is add the numerators. Third step is denominators stay the same. So the only thing we're really adding, we already know how to add the fraction part. Now we're just adding the whole number part. Let's do this example again, but with subtraction, just so we can see that everything can stay the same um, in this problem. So let's do... I'll use a different color. Let's do five and six eighths minus uh, two and four eighths. So step one, add or subtract the whole numbers. In this case, we're subtracting our whole numbers are five and two, five minus two, three. Second step, I'm going to just rewrite the problem. 5 and 6 eighths minus 2 and 4 eighths. We already have our whole number. So next step is add or subtract numerators. So we're going to subtract our numerators. 6 minus 4 is 2. And then our last step, 5 and 6 eighths minus 2 four eighths, we have three and two, and then our denominators stay the same. So we write eight. So our answer is three and two eighths. So with three and two eighths, we can simplify that fraction, but for right now, I just want to get the answer right there for you. So we have eight and three fourths and three and two eighths. So regardless whether you're adding or subtracting, you just follow these steps. First, add the whole numbers, then add the numerators, then the denominators stay the same. And if you need to simplify, um, at the end you can still simplify because 2 eighths, and I hope you can see this, if we do our factors, 1, 2, 1 times 2 is 2, 1, 2, or 8, 1 times 8 is 8, 2 times 4 is 8. The number on both sides in either column is 2, divide by 2, divide by 2, 2 divided by 2 is 1, 8 divided by 2 is 4. So our actual answer simplified would be 3 and 1 fourth once we simplified that fraction. But everything else is the same that we've been doing. Now we just have the whole number to deal with. That's really the only extra step that you're that you're dealing with. Good luck. Okay, so for writing, I know we've been working really, really hard on our fantasy stories, and some of us are right where we need to be. We have all the the elements, and we have all the things day by day that I've been going over. Some people are a little bit behind. So today is going to be a catch-up day. That way, if you, you know, I don't know, get really bored next week on spring break and you want to start working on your story again, you can. I'm just going to write a checklist of all the things that you should have up to this point, And you're going to make sure you have it. And if you have it, you're done with writing for today. And if you don't have it, today is your opportunity to go back. Uh, if you have to go back to other videos, you can. But you're going to go back and you're going to make sure you have everything and you're all caught up. So for sure, you should have characters. You should know the characters in your story at this point. Main characters, bad guys, good guys, everything. You should have a setting. That means you should know when and where your story is taking place. Um, let me think. You should have, um, you should know your problem your problems and conflicts. You should have a rough idea of your beginning, 
middle and end. Remember, that doesn't mean that we're completely done at this point. That just means that you should know the basic uh, idea of your story at this point. You should know your theme. That is the message or heart Oops. of story. Okay. Um, you should have a hook, right, that grabs reader's attention. You should have the rising action. Don't get too confused about rising action. That basically just means, so the hook The hook is similar to the beginning of the story, right? It's just the very few first lines that you're telling me, the very, very beginning of your story. The rising action starts to get into the middle of your story. So just make sure that you have those elements. You might have already written it. Just make sure that you have it. Uh, more fleshed out, right? More information. And then you should go back reading what you have so far, and you should add lots of details just go back instead of saying um, the cat followed the mouse say the fluffy black cat snuck up behind the tiny scared mouse right change your story so you're adding a lot more detail and it's more interesting for the reader just make sure you have these things if you have everything if you've been following along each day you're good you're done. Um, if not, today is the day to go back and make sure that you have all the things that you need. Okay, so for read aloud today, restart chapter nine. And remember yesterday we read chapter eight from the point of view of Chase and he was at the football game and he was talking to his dad who was watching and he had an interaction with Helene and then he remembered something for the first time and it wasn't a very nice memory that he remembered. Today we're going to read chapter 9 and it's also still from the point of view of Chase. So it's still, we're still listening to Chase and what he's going through right now. And I'm not going to, if you notice there's no question, I'm not going to ask you a question until we're done reading because I really want you just to listen. Okay. Chase Ambrose, Chapter 9. After the scrimmage, I head down to the locker room to get some player interviews. I arrive just in time to see Aaron slamming the heavy metal door in Hugo's face. He staggers, staggers backward, straight into me, and lets out a whoop of shock. Take it easy, Hugo, I tell him. It's just me. Hi, Chase, he manages, his voice faltering. I'm trying to shoot some footage of the team. He hefts his own flip cam. I thought Miss DeLeo put me on that, I tell him. Oh, sure, totally, he says quickly. We were just afraid you might, you know, forget. What do you mean forget, I ask, a little annoyed. He retreats a step, blushing and looking pr plenty worried. N n no offense, he stammers. Before I can reply, the door opens and there's Bear. I told you it was his voice, he shouts. He hauls me inside, shutting Hugo out again. Hugo's with me, I protest. Ha, good one, Bear laughs. Seriously, we're covering the hurricanes for the video yearbook. So Hugo gets in with me. He's grateful, but it doesn't make him very happy. He acts like he's tiptoeing around a minefield. I get some high fives. But the team's not in the best of spirits. After all, they just got steamrolled. And when it sinks in that I'm there as a reporter and not to give them the good news that I've been cleared to play, they can't hide their disappointment. Well, I can't see anything wrong with you, Joey complains. You're not even in that sling anymore. I get it. Joey laid an egg at quarterback today. A good running game would take a lot of pressure off him. It's the concussion, I try to explain. The doctor wants me to be really careful. 
Landon Rubio, the kid with the giant neck I saw on the first day, glances dubiously from Hugo to me. So you have to miss a few games, but what gives with him? Hugo attempts to point his camera and is beaten back by a hail of dirty sweat socks. I bristle. The video yearbook is doing a segment on every sports team, including golf and badminton. So when you're not on it, don't come crying to us. Yearbook? Joey echoes. Bad enough you're off the team. Now you're on yearbook staff? Video yearbook, Hugo amends. A snapping towel nearly takes his ear off. Guys, chill out. Aaron steps between the other players and Hugo and me. It isn't our boy's fault his doctor's a wuss. Cut him some slack. That doesn't explain why he's running around with the video losers Landon challenges. He's not running around with anybody, Aaron explains reasonably. He's covering the hurricanes, man, making sure we look good in that yearbook thing. That's how he's helping the team while he's on the sidelines. Yeah, Rubio, snorts Bear. If I had a face like yours, I'd appreciate anyone who could make me look good. So shut up. I jump in as a peacemaker. Believe me, guys, I'll be back as soon as I get the word from my doctor. This makes the team happy, I can tell. Hugo shoots me a strange look, but how can I expect him to understand? He doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who plays sports, except maybe in video games. Joey chucks a ball my way. I watch, almost as a spectator, as my hands reach out and snatch it from the air. Reaction time? A-okay. It feels good, like I'm back to my old am self amnesia couldn't quite rob me of. We do a few interviews. The guys are chatty with me, hamming it up for the camera like I'm running a selfie service. Hugo gets mostly one word answers. When I notice, he mumbles that we can fix it in editing. I don't see how any amount of editing can fix. Question, what are your thoughts for the upcoming season? Answer, good. Then again, I'm just the newbie nobody even trusts to show up for the first two video club assignment. When we're done, Hugo can't get out of there fast enough. This is hostile territory for him. But me? I feel like I'm home. Well, I'd love to talk your ear off about my road to NFL glory, Aaron draws, but Bear and I have to go water some old people. Wait, I'm going with you, I tell them. They stare at me like I've just announced that I'm flying to Jupiter. Dude, you don't have to go, Aaron reminds me. They cut you loose because you got hurt. It'll be fun. That falls flat, so I try again. We're teammates, right? You go, I go. Bear's eyes narrow. Exactly how much do you remember about the Greybeard Motel? Nothing, I reply honestly. He grins. If you want to go there when you don't have to, you didn't just scramble your brains. You knocked them out completely. Come on, how bad can it be? I'm semi-joking, but those two are so stone-faced that I start to wonder, yikes, what is this place, Frankenstein's lab? Your call, Aaron says. It'll be good to have you back with us, even if you're nuts. The Portland Street, the Portland Street Assisted Living Residence is about a 10-minute walk from school. I know I was on community service here before, but the place is brand new to me. It's a boring three-story building with a wide circular drive and a broad landscape front dotted with benches and outdoor picnic tables. There are se several elderly people outside enjoying the warm weather. A couple of them wave and call out greetings to us. I wave back. Aaron and Bear ignore them. As the main door slides open in front of us, Bear mumbles, hold your breath. It's an odd combination of two smells that don't mix fresh flowers, and hospital-like antiseptic. Not great, but you get used to it in a hurry. We report to Nurse Duncan, who's the head nurse on duty. She's surprised to see me. I got better, I tell her, so I figured I should finish off my community service. The court told you that? She asks. I shake my head. I came up with it on my own. We don't believe it either, Aaron jokes with a mock. That's very noble. Nurse Duncan says, well, I've got you boys on the snack cart today. Doesn't normally take three, but we'll give Chase a soft job on his first day back. We get a rolling cart laden with juice boxes, cookies, crackers, and free newspapers. 
By the time we get off the elevator on the third floor, Aaron and Bear have helped themselves to half the merchandise. Believe me, they have more Oreos than these mummies could ever gum down, Aaron says when I look disapproving. And I assure you, oh perfect one, you've sampled plenty of cookies off this cart. I reach back for a snack-jacking memory, but come up empty. I'll have to take his word for it. Bear tears open a bag and dumps a small pile of ginger snaps into my hand. I take a tiny bite, glaring at my partners in crime who are chowing down in a blizzard of wrappers and crumbs. We played a football game this morning, Bear reminds me. You work up an appetite. Not everybody's too delicate like you. I guess I'm not too delicate to bend over and pick up your garbage, I snap, snap back. I might be getting the hang of being friends with these two. We go door to door offering the residents snacks and papers. When I was in the hospital, all the staff and volunteers who came into my room were really nice and friendly. Well, Aaron and Bear are the opposite of that. Aaron's the polite one. He flings the door wide and barks, snack car. This is followed by a, what do you want, from Bear. They call all the men Dumbledore and all the women Dumbledora and respond to any questions with a combination of shrugs and grunts. When I can't stand it anymore, I ask what I can do for everybody and usually end up adjusting bed heights, searching for lost TV remotes, and occasional, occasionally calling nurses. You're slowing us down, man, Aaron complains. At this rate, we'll never blow this Geritol stand. Quiet, I hiss. They'll hear you. You're joking, right? Bear sneers. Most of these old fossils can't remember to change the batteries in their hearing aids. The last thing any of them heard was the A-bomb test at Yucca Flat. They're not as deaf as you think, I shoot back. The lady in 12-2 definitely heard it when you ripped one in her living room. Aaron laughs. Now that's the chase we know and love. Those jokes are funny when it's the three of us, not so much when the old when there are old people around. Most of them are pretty frail. They definitely deserve more respect than they're getting from us. Maybe Aaron and Bear ran out of patience because they've got no choice about community service and I'm here on purpose. Maybe I was out of patience too before my amnesia made me forget it. But I find the residents kind of interesting. They remember stuff in real life that you can only read about in history books. There's a lady in 326 whose father was one of the firemen on the scene of the Hindenburg disaster. The guy in 318 was a communications expert at Houston Mission Control when Neil Armstrong first set foot on the moon. In room 209 lives a guy who's totally blind, yet tells the most vivid stories of growing up two doors down from the Baseball Hall of Famer Joe DiMaggio. The rule is that if someone is not in or sleeping, we leave a juice box and a packet of cookies on the table. The man in 121 is snoring enthusiastically in an easy chair when I notice the black and white photo on his nightstand. It's a picture of a young soldier bowing his head to receive a military de decoration from an important looking man with round steel rimmed spectacles. Is that President Truman? I whisper. Aaron looks bored. Who cares? Let's get out of here. If this Dumbledore wakes up, he'll talk your ear off. But I'm hooked. The only medal you get straight from the president is the Medal of Honor. This guy's a hero. Big deal, Bear scoffs. Back in the day, there were so many wars that they handed out medals like Hershey Kisses. I sigh and start to follow them to the door. I wonder what he did. They don't get a, give out the Medal of Honor for just any old thing. Probably slew a triceratops or something, Aaron suggests with a shrug. Come on, we're almost done. It was a pterodactyl, comes a sarcastic voice from behind us. We wheel around. He's sitting up now, an elderly man, a little bent at the shoulders with a shock of white hair. And I slew it with my stone knife. I step forward. Mister, that's you in the picture, right? No, it's Harry Truman. Can't you see I'm busy? It takes me half an hour to get out of bed and twice that to haul myself across the room with this stupid walker. He's obviously not busy. He just wants a, he just wants to be left alone. Maybe he doesn't like us very much. Apparently, not all the residents are hard of hearing. Aaron and Bear are already slouching out of the room. 
Sorry, I mumble, following them into the hall. You've got to lot you've got a lot to learn, Ambrose, Aaron tells me. Get one of these Dumbledores talking about his war days and you'll be here until you're as old as he is. I have to admit, it's probably good advice. All right, I say, let's just finish. We work our way down the hall to the last room on the floor. Almost done, Aaron groans. Just cloud 10 and we can get out of here. Cloud 10, I echo. You're going to love this one, Bear assures me. You know cloud 9? Well, this old bag's at least one cloud up from that. Half the time she's convinced this is some fancy hotel and we're room service. I see their point, but I feel kind of bad for Mrs. Swanson, who bustles around her living room in a frilly pink dressing gown dotted with sequined flowers. She's obviously losing touch with reality, and there's nothing hilarious about that. At first, she thinks we've come for a visit, and she asks us to move the furniture into what she calls a conversation grouping. Aaron and Bear ignore her, but what harm will it do, really? So I shuffle a few chairs, no big deal. My friends are mugging at me behind her, back the whole, behind her back the whole time, trying to make me laugh. They might be the smart ones. <clears throat> they might be the smart ones. By the time I'm finished, sweaty and breathing hard, Miss Swanson is looking at me like she's too polite to ask who I am and why I'm rearranging her apartment. Aaron and Bear are snickering out loud now. We drop off her cookies and juice and head for the door, but she comes bustling after us waving her pocketbook. She digs around, comes up with a $20 bill, and offers it to me. Don't leave without your tip, she says. I take a step back. Oh no, I couldn't accept. Before I can manage another word, Bear's meaty hand snatches the money away. Enjoy your stay, he tells Mrs. Swanson with a big phony smile, and he's out the door like a shot, Aaron hot on his, on his heels. I catch up to them in the hall. You can't take that money. That's like stealing. I catch up to them and, oh, sorry. No, it's not, Bear replies. She gave it to me. Actually, she gave it to you, but you were too dumb to take it. Yeah, but I fumble for the right words. You know as well as I do that that lady's not all there. That's discrimination, he says righteously. I'm not biased against dizzy old bats who haven't got a clue what the deal is. They can give me money just like everybody else. You don't know her. She would have gotten really upset if you hadn't taken it. She wants to believe what she believes. We're not here for kicks, you know, I insist. We got sent here by a judge. If we get caught accepting money from the residents, we could get in a lot more. We can get a lot more than community service. Bear rounds on me in genuine amazement. You don't even have to be here, man. You made us bring you. I'm stubborn. Give the money back. Aaron tries to be reasonable. The museum pieces in this dump, they'd forget their own saggy butts if they weren't attached. By the time the door closed behind us, I guarantee Cloud 10 forgot we were ever there. If we go to her and try to straighten this out, it'll be like showing her how crazy she is. You want to be responsible for that? I know he's snowing me, but he's also kind of right. I doubt we could explain to Miss Swanson that she just tipped the community service guys. But even if we could, she'd be embarrassed and upset and probably more confused than before. We should give the money to charity, I mumble. Done, Bear agrees. It's going to my favorite charity, the Take a Bear to Lunch Fund. Who's up for pizza? We all laugh, but I'm laughing a lot less than those two. The whole thing leaves a sour taste in my mouth and pizza is the last thing I'm thinking about. We stop in to see Nurse Duncan so Aaron and Bear can get their timesheet signed. I'm not technically on community service anymore, so there's no timesheet for me. Then we're heading for the pizza place like nothing ever happened. I keep looking at Bear, expecting to see the 20 glowing orange and burning through the pocket of his jeans. I can't explain it, but the more they goof around tripping and shoving each other, the less appetite I have for lunch. You okay, Ambrose? Aaron tosses at me in concern. You don't look so hot. Uh, I'll catch up with you guys later. I pound back in the direction of Portland Street. I hang a left and sprint up to the assisted living residence, then dash in the sliding door and straight to room 100. I pull a fistful of crumpled bills from my pocket and fish out a 20. Aaron's right. 
I'd never be able to explain to Mrs. Swanson why I'm giving her money for what she could only see as no reason. No, my plan is simpler than that. I'll slip it right under her door. When she notices it, she'll assume she dropped it. As I squat down and pass the bill through the gap between the door and the carpet, it occurs to me that if anybody sees me, it'll look like I'm the one doing something sleazy, not the one making it right. Luck is with me, though. I'm able to return the 20 unobserved. No, not return. I remind myself I'm out 20 bucks in this deal. I feel a little resentful when I picture Aaron and Bear feasting on pizza that I'm essentially paying for. But it's a small price tag for being able to sleep at night. As I make my way out again, I pause in front of room 121, the Medal of Honor guy's room. I squint at the small plaque on the wall, Mr. Julius Solway. The door is open a crack and I catch a glimpse of Mr. Solway struggling across the room on his walker. Suddenly, a bail baleful eye is glaring at me through the opening. You're back, Mr. Solway's raspy voice growls from inside. What do you want now? My instinct is to flee, but curiosity gets the best of me. Which war was it? I asked the old man. You know, where you won the medal. The Trojan War, he barks. Remember Achilles? I was the one who got him right at the heel. It stings, but I say, I didn't mean to disturb you, and start away. Korea, he calls after my retreat, retreating back. 1952. I turn. It's an honor to meet you, Mr. Solway. You must have done something really heroic. Everyone did, he replies gruffly. A lot of brave men are still buried there. They're the heroes. I'm just the one they picked to hang a bauble on. I can't help asking, what did you do? To earn the medal, I mean. I can still only see one eye, but it's impossible to miss the flash of impatience. I stood on my head and spit nickels. Listen, smart guy, when you get to be my age, you don't always remember the details of every single event in your life. But I don't expect a young punk like you to understand that. He closes the door. Old people are supposed to have wisdom, but Mr. Soloway is definitely wrong about me. I've already forgotten more than he'll ever know. Oh, I'm really thirsty now after reading that. So after reading that, I think we keep learning more and more about Chase. And it's really interesting to me that his friends were basically taking this $20 and he decided to go give the $20 back his own $20. And that's not something a lot of people would do. So the question that I'm going to ask you um, to answer is do you like Chase? Why or why not? So again, three to five sentences. Some of you guys will see a question like that and your answer will say yes. No, I need to know why. Why do you like him or why do you not like him? What what about him? What have what has he done or what have we learned about him to make you like or not like him? At this point in the story, are you rooting for him? Are you hoping that he's going to change and be um, a nicer person than he was before his accident? Are you hoping that something bad happens and, I don't know, he <laughs> ends up being a bad guy again? What do you think about Chase? I want to know.